Hi everyone. Um, this lecture is a good segue to Dr. Flan's lecture. Actually, uh, there was an error in the title of, our, of my presentation. Uh, I'm not speaking on anxiety disorders, I'm speaking on the novel skill-based approaches and their impact on healthcare professionals' management of depression, and actually mental illness. And uh, the reason why I say it's a good segue is that this program, uh, which we've ev evaluated, was developed for primary care providers. And we have the same problem in Canada where we have to do things differently. And uh, the, the intent is to start with primary care providers, which means primary care physicians, men, uh, medical office assistants, nurse practitioners, all the office staff, and then to um, build collaborative care teams eventually. So this works well. So just to show you a little bit where we took the training, that's all the way, this Canada, all the way to BC, and here's our little province in Nova Scotia. So we went far to get our trainers, and believe me, it was worthwhile. Uh, the program was developed by the Minister of Health of British Columbia, by the um, Medical Association of BC, um, and also by the Canadian Mental Health Association. So what is unique about this, uh, this program? Uh, basically, uh, instead of having a podium type lecture, there's three half day sessions spanned over about five to six months with six to four week action periods in between. The action periods are essential because uh, learners get to practice what they've learned immediately with a lot of protocols and prompts so they, they're able to uh, retain the information. In addition to that, there's contact-based education where a person with lived experience talks about their, their, um, their experience with mental illness and a strong focus of recovery. Um, so uh, primary care providers or primary care physicians in particular uh, see patients in crisis all the time. And so it, the, you get the impression that people don't get better with mental illness. And so this is a, a stigma buster. And in fact, that was one of our primary care out, uh, primary outcome for primary care physicians. Other uh, components of the program, self-management strategies for patients. So in addition to the help with diagnosis, management, screening, uh, self-management strategies which are based on cognitive behavior, in, uh, cognitive behavior um, based principles help uh, share the load between primary care physicians or primary care providers and patients. And primary care providers act as coaches, help patients through. Um, we had things like cognitive uh, behavior interpersonal skills workbook, the antidepressant skills workbook, bounce back program which uh, consisted of a DVD where patients could work through those strategies but also uh, telephone guided um, type service where uh, mental health workers or mental health coaches would help patients through those strategies. In addition to that, we had a practice support coordinator, and she's sitting right here in the audience, who visited the offices on site, helped with office redesign, helped with addressing challenges and implementing the strategy. So that worked really well. Um, the other uh, uh, component is system redesign. Uh, we paid the, the practices to attend the training, and that included everyone from uh, the mental, uh, medical office assistant to the primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, counselors, all, all the office staff. And also um, primary care physicians received uh, CME credits as well as additional uh, medical fee codes that they could bill because we also are based on a system of fee-for-service. Fee so who is it for? Patients that present with depression, anxiety, unexplained somatic symptoms, uh, chronic pain, thick chart, anyone that would uh, trigger a mental health screening. And we use depression as the lens to do our study, just simply because it was very common in primary care. Our study design, 
So we had a multi, multi-site, double-blind, two-parallel group, cluster randomized controlled trial. That's a mouthful. And uh, the practices were the unit of randomization, where they were randomized through the training program or treatment as usual. And if you see our province of Nova Scotia, we had everybody kind of spanned over the province. So this, these are our um, allocations here. So we had two groups that we evaluated. We had our physicians and we had our patients, and both primary outcomes were in both groups. So for the patients, we started with 77 practices, 111 primary care providers. Um, 39 practices and 56 physicians got randomized to the intervention group, 38 got randomized to the control group with 55 physicians, and after attrition, we were left with uh, 51 in the intervention, 50 in the control, and uh, only 39 physicians completed the pre and post test as opposed to 34 in the control, the intervention versus the control. So we had calculated that we required a sample size of about 50 physicians in, in each group. And so we were underpowered in this group. For the patient specifically, when we adjusted for the cluster or the design effect, we required 113 patients per group. And we were left with, our final sample was 129 uh, patients, uh, 72 in the intervention group, 57 in the control group. So we asked physicians to identify three consecutive patients in order to avoid selection bias. And we were left with that sample. And after attrition, only, 20, um, only 26 practices identified patients in the intervention group, and we were left with 65 uh, uh, participants or, or patients. And only 21 practices identified uh, patients in the, control, in the control group, and we were left with 51 patients. So we, we were underpowered. However, we took this as... Um, a pilot study, we didn't know what we were looking for, so we asked for a lot of outcomes, and w this will inform now a larger research pro program where the research team is already going to be submitting for. Okay, so the physician's outcome first, uh, we're looking at the impact on stigma. Um, why is that important? Because our attitudes and beliefs uh, towards mental illness really uh, makes a difference on how we care, support for, pr provide opportunities to our patients. And we use the opening mind scales for uh, healthcare professionals, and that's a validated tool developed by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. And we also use, this was the overall uh, stigma score, and we also use three subscales, the attitudes towards mental illness uh, that was created from this tool, the attitudes towards mental illness, um, um, willingness to disclose, and also a preference for social distance. And we evaluated physicians at uh, pre-training, post-training, and six months follow-up. We also looked at the confidence level of physicians. We, looked, we used a, a modified questionnaire, a British Columbia a questionnaire modified for Nova Scotia. We used the overall questionnaire, but we also subdivided this in three sub uh, scales. The first one was a measure of the management of en mental illness, so all from screening to diagnosing to developing care plans to knowing what where the resources are in the community, etc. Second measure was um, the familiarity and confidence of non-program specific tools, and these are tools that are found in the public d domain. PHQ-9, GAD-7, uh, PHQ-2, things like that, audit. And then the program-specific tools are the programs that I just talked about. And so our, the timing of uh, was also pre-training, pre post-training, and six months follow-up. So our hypothesis was if you increase the confidence level, then you will decrease the stigma. So our results? So we looked at... We looked at age, gender, years of practice, pattern of work, practice type, and 
number of unique patients per year. And there was no significant difference except that the control group tended to work in larger groups. So we adjusted for this uh, in our analysis. For the, our primary result, our primary outcome, we, you can see that the total scale was approaching significance. Um, however, the preference for social distance was significant, so that's an important dimension of stigma. For the confidence level, you can see that at every level of uh, management, of confidence with program-specific tools and confidence with non-program-specific tools, we had a statistically significant improvement in favor of the intervention, except for treating other mental health illnesses. And that stands to reason because our research was on depression. And there you go. And then we looked at our uh, physicians' confidence correlated with decreases in, in stigma. So we created a, sc a scatter plot and it was significant. They are relation uh, related, there is a relationship. We found that there was a baseline interaction uh, by gender, uh, for gender, w with that relationship. And so we repeated the analysis, and in fact, we found that um, this was uh, uh, significant for men, but not for women. So we looked at the baseline stigma, and for men, it was higher. And this is expected because uh, m at least many cultures, uh, men showing signs of vulnerability is a sign of weakness. So you're not expected to disclose or, or um, mental illness becomes a vulnerability and a weakness. And men get a double hit because the culture of medicine is such as well that you have to be invincible. You have to be a caregiver, not a care receiver. And so men get a double hit. When we correct it for the baseline, um, elevated stigma in men, we got the same result. There was a relationship uh, with that improvement or, or the improvement in confidence reduced stigma. When we looked at our three subscales improvement in confidence, we again found that that relationship was positive uh, for negative attitudes. When we looked at managing mental illness, increase in confidence uh, improved negative attitudes. And for the program-specific tools and program non-specific tools, there was an improvement in preference for social distance. And our total scale, although not positive or not significant, was strongly approaching significance. Our patient objective studies, we looked at the impact on improvement of depression ratings. We used the PHQ-9, the Personal Health Questionnaire 9, which it has the DSM-5 criteria. Um, for our measure. And our time period was baseline one month, two months, three months, and six months post uh, uh, enrollment in the study. We also looked at a secondary objective, uh, occupational functioning. And for that, we used the uh, LAM employment absence and productivity scale. And we also used the Sheehan disability scale. Uh, the Sheehan dis Disability Scale has functioning in three areas, also uh, socially and at home. Uh, so we looked at that functioning as well. And exploratory objectives, uh, do physicians rely less on antidepress uh, antidepressant prescribing? There was anecdotal reports in BC that physicians lied, uh, relied less on antidepressant prescribing. Uh, our patients, uh, uh, have more satisfaction with the level of care they receive, and what about the quality of life? So the assessment tools were the short form 36, client service uh, receipt inventory, and client satisfaction inventory. Patient results. So our patients, we looked at We looked at age, gender, marital status, employment status, education, household composition, and first language. And there was, were no significant changes at baseline. Um, our uh, sample population were predominantly female, married, living common law, under the age of 50 years, 
and employed and post-secondary educated. Um, patients that were lost to follow-up, they tended to have a higher PHQ-9 score uh, of 19.5, which was borderline severe, as opposed to 16.8, which was borderline moderate. And also they tended to be unemployed, 45.5% as opposed to 14.5%. So here are primary outcome results. We can see that from one to uh, three months, there both groups improved as we also often see in research. However, the intervention group continues to improve and the control group actually worsens from three months to six months. And this was statistically significant. The occupational functioning in both groups, they improved from one to three months and also the overall functioning. However, both groups, uh, the improvement slowed down from three to, to six months and that was not statistically significant between groups. We also found that the quality of life as well as the client satisfaction was not clinically significant between both groups. The antidepressant prescribing, that was significant. The intervention group relied less on antidepress antidepressant prescribing, so they did that even though patients improved in the intervention, they did that with less medication. So our assumption at this point is that the tools were really what made that difference because that was the only difference. Everything was taken at the same time point in both groups. So in summary, we had a significant reduction in professional preference for social distance. We had an increase in physicians' level of confidence and that was um, in treating depression. We make assumptions that that could be in other uh, illnesses as well as in particular anxiety. Um, we had a significant relationship between uh, increases in physicians' level of confidence and reduction in stigma, and that was gender related. Uh, we had significant change and improvement in favor of the intervention group in depression ratings. Um, in particular, well, it was from three to six months. Um, the antidepressant use at six months follow-up was significantly lower, and the other items, work-related uh, disability, quality of life, patient satisfaction, were not uh, significantly different between groups. So our larger study, or the larger study, um, the idea is to use uh, more sites. Uh, we weren't aware that it was so difficult to recruit. We thought we were going to have enough patients, but we didn't. And, um, and also perhaps longer to see if that trend continues longer than six months, and uh, in addition to other things. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. There was an intervention done with docs, basically, primary care docs. Yes. And uh, some all sort of interesting program. And the main finding is, is that patients in the intervention group, the docs who had the intervention, were better in terms of their depression, mm -hmm. and importantly, were getting less medicines. Exactly. So what is it that the docs were doing? to get them better? You said using the tools, but I didn't understand that. Yes, what so the, the self-management tools, in addition to the diagnostic tools and the screening tools, not only were they identifying other items, either common mental illness that we see in primary care, there was a diagnostic assessment tool that consisted of quite a variety, but it was the self-management tools that patients used, and they are based on cognitive behavior uh, principles. So it's not the actual cognitive behavior therapy as a psychologist would do. However, patients worked through this and they were able to help themselves. There were plenty of strategies. Plus there was a bounce back program where it was telephone guided where mental health workers really helped uh, patients work through those strategies if, if physicians didn't have time to do so. So you 
actually hooked the patients up with another human being that they could access. Exactly, needed. yeah. And this, this was on the choice of the ph physician. The program was flexible. We did, there was no protocol-driven pro um, uh, management, so they could choose uh, whatever they wanted. There were tools, let's say if a patient was anxious, there were tools of what to do, et cetera, et cetera. Any other questions? Good. Thank you very much.